You're listening to Change Your POV Podcast, episode 48. I went to my first TAPS class. I realized, oh, wait a second. Most of my career is probably behind me, and now I gotta work on this plan of getting out. And that's kind of why I went to Saudi Arabia. That's why I'm here in New Orleans. Like, I'm now having to balance my plan to stay in, my plan to get out. So those would be the three things I would say. Think two tours ahead, think two OERs or fit reps ahead, and have a plan to stay in and have a plan to get out and be comfortable with both. Welcome to Change Your POV Podcast, helping you navigate transitions in your life, like entering and exiting college or the military, changing jobs or careers, and providing you with the coaching and mentorship needed to help you advance in your personal or professional life. Sometimes all you need is to change your point of view. Now, here's your host, Eddie Lazary. Welcome to Change Your POV. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and I have the privilege of sitting down with Travis Collier. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, sir. How are you this evening? I am fantastic. So Travis reached out to me, and uh, well, first he told me he was an officer, and I'm like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> and, then, and then he tells me he's in the Coast Guard. I'm like, what? So I figured, you know what? I'm killing two birds with one stone here because I've yet to have an officer on the show and I've yet to have anyone from the Coast Guard. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Eddie. Thank you. I'm very, very cool. Um, and I'm very excited. We'll get into a little bit uh, more of kind of what you've got going on. But before we before we um, ruin this surprise and, and, and uh, our audience um, gets to know too much about you mm-hmm. um, and what you got going on today, I'd like to kind of turn back the – the hands of the clock, if you will, Mm -hmm. and find out a little bit more about Travis and kind of where you come from. Um, Why did, you know, why is it the Coast Guard and uh, kind of uh, your military experience, your active duty. So you have not made the transition out of the Coast Guard yet, but you're fixing to. Mm -hmm. Um, That's going to play a big part in what we discuss a little bit later in the interview. But uh, like I said, before we get too further, let's, uh, let's let the audience know a little bit about you. Sure. Thank you, Eddie. I remember the standard college conversation that you have with your parents about where you want to go to college at. And the day I turned 17, 19 years ago, please don't count, (laughs) I had the appointment letter to, to the Coast Guard Academy on my kitchen table with my parents. And I'm originally from Georgia, so the accent betrays everybody. And Back then, it was go to UGA or go to Georgia Tech. And the academy was the biggest opportunity that I had on the table. Uh, my father was drafted in 61 and got out in 63 before the surge in Vietnam. And for him, he said, you know, you're going to have a job when you graduate the academy. Worst comes to worst, you don't make it. You can still go to a state school. So I said, sure, let me give it a shot. And Mm -hmm. I enrolled to the Coast Guard Academy. I started 7 July 1997. I got a 1.24 my first semester at the Academy. I thought it was done all over. (laughs) Seriously, I got a one point. I failed Cal and Chem. And I went back to the Dean of Academics. And he was, you know, he was going through disenrolling cadets, putting cadets on probation. And he said, so what do you want to do? And... I said, I want a 325, and I want to ace my PFT in two years. And in two years, I got both of those goals done, and I've been in ever since. So active duty-wise, I've been stationed in a lot of places. Um, New Jersey, Virginia, South Texas, wine country, Sonoma County, California, uh, Saudi Arabia, a coasty in Saudi. Trust me, we're rarities in the sand pit. <laughs> we are. And I'm currently a... Uh, commercial vessel inspector here in the port of New Orleans in, in Festival City. That's awesome. So, yeah, I joined in 96. So I was I joined right a year before you. Cool. Um, enlisted, of course. I, I didn't attend any college. But um, So talk to us a little bit about, because I could tell you that uh, when I first, obviously, we, we joined prior to 9-11. Mm-hmm. 
and then um, you know the the stars shifted after that. And describe for us a little bit kind of the shift or the change that the Coast Guard went through uh, from pre nine eleven to post nine eleven. Okay, um, I was an ensign. I, gr- I was class two thousand and one, so I graduated uh, May twenty third. So when I did go underway my senior summer, and after I graduated the academy we were fighting for fuel to get ships underway to do do patrols and deployments. It was a a very austere time. We had boats tied up because we couldn't afford to get them out on patrol. And I remember I was actually in Groton when 9-11 happened, unfortunately. And we pulled back in and we had a couple of major casualties. We couldn't get back underway for 9-11. And we had to help out our sister ship get enough parts that she needed so she can go patrol New York City because New York was in our, our area responsibility. So it was, mm-hmm. it was a different time. And the whole idea about homeland security, especially in the commercial vessel field, it doubled our workload instantly when uh, the Maritime Transportation Security Act came out in, in 2004, 2005. We didn't do security to the extent that we do security now. And even doing our ports and wa- port waterways, coastal security mission, it wasn't this idea of thinking about terrorists. We were thinking about directed boaters mostly. So it's security has become a major watch day to us. We have a lot more robust, capa- robust capacity to handle security. And the Coast Guard grew significantly uh, post 9 11 because of the demands for security in the port and maritime community. Mm. Has the roles of engagements in terms of uh... Um, ROEs changed at all since 9-11? Um, for us, no. So we don't really use standing ROE unless we're on deployment. So our coast is doing Title 10 work over in the Persian Gulf. They follow ROE. Our Coast Guard use of force doctrine remains the same. Uh, minimum force necessary to compel compliance. We train our law enforcement teams and specialists to exercise that type of judgment. So it's, it's a different world. Um, our maritime law enforcement doesn't match evenly with standing ROE. And again, the nature of the threat's a little bit different. For us, we're very preventive in our efforts. We, mm. a lot of standing patrols, a lot of boat hours underway, a lot of vessel screening before ships come into country. For example, every foreign flagship has to file a notice of arrival within 96 hours. And us, uh, customs actually, and several other agencies will vet ships before they even come in to figure out if those ships may or may not be a threat. Um, we prioritize vessel arrivals based on countries that they're coming from, which is very interesting. And we try to take a very proactive approach to focus our resources, because you know we're the Coast Guard. We're 45,000 people. We, we aren't a lot. Um, and we're often forgotten about, like you said. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned something that just kind of jumped at me, and that's that's having a, a more of a proactive position. Mm-hmm. and. And I can see how the conventional, you know, uh, fighting force like the uh, Marine Corps and Army, uh, we are really more reactionary than we are proactive. What I mean by that is, you know, we're we're always on the ready, but we're always constantly training and 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 getting ready for whatever might come. But we usually don't do anything until it's a response to something else, right? And the Coast Guard's kind of the opposite. You guys are, you know, out there and you know, positioned and, and have more of a proactive stance given your, your different mission. And so that's just kind of a unique uh, perspective on kind of the different roles that the Coast Guard has um, uh, from that of other services. Now, in terms of rank, I am, I, I got to admit, man, full transparency here. I'm very ignorant when it comes to uh, not just the Coast Guard rank, but the, the Navy and Air Force as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, describe for us real quick the uh, what rank you are and kind of where that is in the, in the chain of command type of thing. So I am a lieutenant commander. I'm an 04, so I'm a major equivalent. Uh, I've been in 15 years. So uh, the naval ranks are the same. So us in the Navy have the same rank, but we wear a shield. They wear the star. Uh, we're more blue. They're more black. Uh, we still use a lot of Air Force blouses and shirts as well because we can't fund our own sometimes um <laughs> that is humor coasties please don't take that the wrong way so I, i'm an 04 i'm a, I'm a line in, in the coast guard um we don't have a lot of limited duty like dod does so we all we go for promotion boards we all sit against each other promotion boards so me being a uh, what we call a marine inspector 
and a training officer going up against a cutterman, so like a surface warfare officer or an aviator. We all sit in front of the same board in the same panel. And then our panels have specialists across the Coast Guard that adjudicate to figure out who will and, and will not promote. So that's where I sit in New York. Oh, and then locally here, um, ports, major ports in the United States usually have an 06 in charge. So New Orleans has an 06 who commands the port of New Orleans called the captain of the port. He also has a lot of other names based on the regulatory authorities that we, he may or may not have out of the CFR. Um, but from that 06, then it works its way down to the departments and the divisions, which is somewhat similar, but we are more size and scope based on the nature of the work in the port, more so than having your standard fire team, platoon, squad, and company. Mm, right, right. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Thanks for that breakdown. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I always love talking with folks that are of a different service or, or branch than me. Um, because sometimes you get, you get such a myopic view of, you know, your own little foxhole. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's interesting to hear different, different folks and what they've got going on and everyone's contributing to the mission some, in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, let's get into a little bit about, um, kind of, uh, kind of, we'll get into a little bit about why, um, I really wanted to have you on this show in terms of. Uh, what you've got going on in terms of transition. Before we get down that road, I want to ask you some other questions. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I don't get a, an opportunity to talk to a whole lot of uh, active duty folks. A lot of them are, um, you know, post-military mm -hmm. um, veterans. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really, really excited about uh, talking with active duty. So um, I would like to know when you're pursuing a goal or a dream or a project and it starts to fail or become more difficult than you thought, how do you know when it's time to pull the plug or keep driving on? And I know in the military, it's a little bit difficult because in the military, there is no real kind of option to give up or quit, right? right. You just got to keep going and, and doing, you know, whatever you got to do. Um, but you know, you've got things on the side that you're pursuing. We'll get into those in a minute. Um, but you know, how do you know? Cause sometimes I'll be honest with you. I've known folks that, you know, I look at what they're doing. And I think to myself, man, you know, they should really give it up because they, they're kind of working on a failed venture. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody, somebody should really kind of clue them in that, 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 that what they're doing is probably not going to, uh, amount to much. And then you got other people that's kind of the other side of the spectrum. And it's like, you know, you look at them, you're like, damn, man, you just gave up way too soon. You know, if you would have stuck it out a little bit longer, you would have had something. You know what I mean? So how do you know if someone's in that position? How do they know whether they're working on something that's already, you know, dead on the vine or if they should just push through and keep going? That's a very good question. Let me tell a brief story. I used to sell real estate. Active duty, I sold real estate on the side when I was stationed in South Texas. I sold two homes in about three and a half years selling real estate. And... That means I was extremely unsuccessful. This is 2007 to 2010. Um, I didn't know what I got myself into when I got started. I thought my shot at the real estate bubble was to be a, a realtor, not necessarily to be a home flipper or, or an investor because I couldn't afford to do that. Um, I didn't know when to say no. I, but I think now that I'm older, it's the clock. It's the schedule. It's it's the, the amount of investment and it's about, I think people have more fear to chase good money after bad than they do to, to necessarily let go. Um, for me, it's if I'm spending, if I'm spending my weekends and stuff that doesn't affect me either a make it on the outside or, or B promote and advance my qualifications, then I'm kind of sort of wasting my time. And yeah, it's the clock. I think right now it's the clock. If you want, uh, David Sedaris talks about four burner theory. And the four burners he says that you have in life are work, family, friends, and health. Great people survive with three. Incredible people can survive with two. So we know what it feels like. We know how continuous partial attention feels. We know how you know status envy and check-in envy feels. But if you're burning four burners, the clock will show you that you're running out of time. Whereas if you're burning three burners or two burners, um, you really have a chance to dig in, fail, and learn. And sometimes 
you've got to fail to learn more often than not. Mm. Yeah. And that's, I, I totally agree with that. And so, um, a lot of people say, you know, you've heard, you've heard that old cliche that you, it's better to learn from other people's mistakes than it is to make your own. Yeah. Uh, I, it, and I believe that to an extent, uh, but at the same time, there are just certain lessons that you just will never learn unless you make them yourself. Absolutely. Um, so let me, let me ask, so you're 15 years, um, you, you know, you're, you're now looking at the, the horizon on the backside of, of, of your service. Mm -hmm. What would, what would you say to the young, um, the young junior enlisted and the young officers are coming into, uh, the Coast Guard today? Mm -hmm. A couple of things I've learned over my time that are regardless of whether you stay in or out. And I have four O3s who work for me and about 40 people. So I get to, to practice as well as preach more often than I realize. Um, think two tours ahead. Part of my career decision got me to 04 without any thought of making it to 05. And I am happy and satisfied with my decision. I'm ecstatic of my decision. Um, I didn't think two tours ahead when I picked up grad school. I, uh, after I got out of grad school and I was in my payback tour, I had some friends of mine who told me, if you want to make 05, if you want to make this a long-term career, here's the path you need to go. And I said, no. I said, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I love you. But I think it's time for me to, to, to level up and try something different. So the number one thing I, I, I would say is think two tours ahead. I also say think two OERs ahead, think two fit reps ahead. It's very short term, it's very tactical, but a lot of times a project you start may not finish in your six month or one year window. So you've got to figure out, will it finish soon? Will it finish late? Because that'll help you figure out what investments to make. And then the third thing I would say, and I got this from my 05 in, in California when I was stationed there, and I didn't, you know, it took me 12 years to hear this, and that was to have a plan to get in or stay in and have a plan to get out. And I really never had a plan to get out until now. I never thought about getting out. Um, when I got past over row three, I doubled down on my career and taking MTTs and trips overseas and deploying as much as I possibly could. I, when I picked up grad school, I, I knew that grad school guaranteed me a certain number of years. When I came into the field before to do marine inspections, like I, I, I took every, choice in my career as a plan to double down and staying in. And I never thought about getting out. And then as I was in California, I went to my first TAPS class. I realized, oh, wait a second, most of my career is probably behind me. And, and now I got to work on this plan of getting out. And that's kind of why I went to Saudi Arabia. That's why I'm here in New Orleans. Like I'm now having to balance my plan to stay in, my plan to get out. So those would be the three things I would say. Think two tours ahead. Think two OERs or fit reps ahead. And have a plan to stay in and have a plan to get out and be comfortable with both. So that's interesting you bring that up in terms of, you know, it dawns on you that, that you've got to start looking at a plan to get out. And uh, I unfortunately, I, I, I didn't. I had no plans whatsoever, had no idea what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. I just one day found myself driving off of Fort Hood for the last time ever, going home, taking off my uniform for the last time ever, mm -hmm. and then, you know, throwing it on the bed, crumpled up, and I just remember looking at it thinking, and then, and then it, hit, it hit me. I'm like, wow, that's it. I'm out. I'm done. Uh, like, and I, I have no I have no idea what I'm going to do. Wow. Um, and there's so many there's so many people out there that are just like that. Mm -hmm. And that's really the reason why I created uh, change your POV. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm interviewing people that have both been in my shoes and those that have, um, had a little bit more of a foresight like yourself. And that's really what I'm trying to do is encourage people to, you know, take the blinders off. You know, you go to the range, you, you and, and, and here's, here's a story, right? Before I, before I deployed to Iraq, uh -huh. we would go to the we would go to the firing range, and I don't I don't know how it is in the Coast Guard, but in the Army, we'd have weapons qualification, uh -huh. and we you know it was mandatory. Uh, we would go and we have to qualify, and of course you have got the uh, on the range you got these pop up targets, uh -huh. right? You got the the 50 meter, you got the 100, 150, 200, 250, and then of course 
you know, that bad boy way out there at 300 meter, right? <laughs> of, course, of course, it's all iron sights. You know, we weren't qualifying at the time with any, you know, a Neotech or, or ACOG or anything like that. And, um, and aver- you know, of course, you, you've got a, a, a series where you're firing, you know, prone supported and the series that you're firing prone unsupported. And you've got a certain number of, uh, of rounds that you can expend and a certain number of targets that pop up. And so uh, you have the ability to kind of uh, conserve your ammo a little bit and, and really kind of pick and choose which targets you want to hit, mm-hmm. you know, because it's an overall, you know, target down type of score. Mm-hmm. And all of my buddies, myself included, you know, we would all like, you know, not shoot at the 50 meter targets <laughs> because we wanted to save those couple extra rounds to have, uh, you know, more times at bat at those 300 meter targets because, you know, it's it's so much cooler to get your print out of your weapons qualification and see that, you know, you took down 300 meter targets, you know, because you were a, a, that good of a shot, right? Right, and, right. And so, so, yeah, so that's the thing, right? Before we go to, before I go to combat, like that was the big thing is everybody's focusing on that 300 meter target. Mm-hmm. And then I get the, then I go to, to uh, Baghdad and fighting in insurgents. And you know what? It's not the guys that are 300 meters away that it's going to kill you. No. It's those guys that are 50 meters or closer that are going to, that are doing the most damage. And you know what? It's just a different change in perspective that before, before you go to the show and the bullets start flying, we call it the uh, two-way firing range, right? Mm-hmm. Where they're firing back at you, mm-hmm. and, and and it's just that change in perspective. And I and I kind of relate that to um, getting out of the military. A lot of people, um, it's reverse, right? They they only look at getting out at the 50 meter mark mm-hmm. once they once they're 50 meters away from getting out. When you really should be looking at getting out, you know, 300 meters or even further away. Mm-hmm. And I've asked several people, what's the optimum time to prepare to get out? And the, the, the most common response is 12 months or more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and most people kind of gear more towards the, the more side than the 12 months. Um, but when, at what point did, I mean, was it the TAPS class or was it hearing horror stories of guys getting out? I mean, what finally kind of made that light bulb come on that says, oh, hey, I really need to develop a plan here? The TAPS class started it. And my TAF instructor, uh, CJ, she's amazing. And she said a couple of things that stuck with me from that class. Uh, the first thing she said was, and this was a class of senior officers, senior enlisted. So my 06 was in the class. He was retiring the next summer. He was shocked to see me sitting beside him. She said, for every $10,000 you want to make in salary, expect a month. So if you want to make 100 grand and we're in Northern California, the 100 grand won't go far. Expect at least 10 months. And then she said, not only that, don't expect to use your retirement as a buffer for your salary. You should save your entire retirement and never touch it for the first 10 years you're out. And all our jaws dropped. And these are, you know, these are officers senior enlisted with 25, 26, 28 years in who had never been told that before. So that was kind of the, the, the first hit. Um, I was listening, I was in the seminar and I was reading The Impact Equation by Chris Brogan, who talks about how to have impact. And a couple of things that stood out for there was this idea of reach and platform. I had a blog because I was in California. If you're in the Bay Area, you better have a blog or no one listens to you. So I had a blog for about three years, three and a half years. And this whole idea about platform and reach and how if more of your life would be on the outside, your platform should precede you outside. So you should, I guess, shadow your target maybe. Um, That's where it kind of started in 2012. And then going to Saudi Arabia and realizing that I am in a job that was an amazing job. I got to wear woodland camouflage, which is a rarity for a Coastie. Um, I got to see security assistance firsthand, which I hadn't seen in a long time. And Mm -hmm. I was able to take what I got into grad school for, to be an instructional designer, to be a, a consultant. I know we don't say consultants or officers or, or whatever, but to help do this infrastructure development work. And I'm like, wait a minute, this, these jobs are out here and they're out here now. They're not six years from now, seven years from now, 10 years ago, they're out here right now. And coming back from deployment, I'm thinking, well, if I want to do that when I get out, how do I make myself ready for that now for then? So it started in 2012. 
Um, and I've had these, these hits all across the board. When I wrote my first book last year called Scale, I wrote it, part of the image I had in my mind of writing that book was, there's a Starbucks on Sunset La Brea in North Hollywood, and I remember seeing all these aspiring screenwriters and actors and wannabe Hollywood big shots in this place, and I remember thinking, you know, that aspiring screenwriter with his papers strewn over the stand-up table has been in every day for this one week I was in LA. That is his life, not how he's gonna make it, but that he's happy being the aspiring screenwriter. I'm like, I don't want to walk away from that uniform and be someone who's just aspiring. It just doesn't work. So 2012, 2014, and really 2014, 2015 was re were really the, the, uh, the flares I needed to see that my horizon is a different horizon and it's time to start considering something different. And so how has that been for you so far? It has been interesting because we always expect our leaders to always want to go for the next ring. We always expect people in the organization to be fully committed to the organization. Especially after you have 10 years of service. Like after year 10, if you're not committed, then why are you here? And I am committed, I love what I do, but I'm not putting in the 16, 17 hour days I know I could put in to make myself most competitive for promotion. Like for me, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at, I'm happy what I'm gonna do. If I stay in the, the Coast Guard, I know exactly who I will leave in two years, I know the job I will have, I know exactly where I will go, it's probably the Beltway. Um, I have more clarity about my career now than I've ever had in the first 15 years. And it, it takes a moment to, uh, like your moment where you, you took off your uniform, you crumpled it in the corner, and you sat down in your lounge chair at home, and you realized, I'm never going to have to go back to Fort Hood. I'm kind of having that, that feeling now um, in that there is a path I know I personally will take, and I know there is advice that works for me, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship or to coaching, or like life coaching, or transition coaching, or to organizational behavior and development that works for me and what I wanna do, but that's not what my people need because my people, for the majority, aren't at a point where they are tenured to the organization where they can make the same decision. They still need to get over the 04 hump, so, or 03 hump, or E7 hump, or E8 hump, wherever it is. So it's helped me to realize that I still have an obligation to be the best leader I can be, period. But I have an obligation to myself too, and my obligation to myself is not exclusive or mutually exclusive. Uh -huh. See, I like that, obligation to yourself, absolutely. And and so, okay, so this is where I'm, this is, this is something that I think about now, uh -huh. but I never thought about when I was in. And let me get your take on it now, because you're, you're still in. Mm -hmm. um, as a, I was a non-commissioned officer, staff sergeant E6, mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I had I had some um, junior NCOs below me and, and of course, lower enlisted. Mm -hmm. And my job was to train uh, my squad and my soldiers for combat. I would take them to the field and I would uh, teach them their job, their roles. We would uh, we would do sand table rock drills, mm -hmm. run different scenarios. We had, uh, you know, simulators we would go. Um, I, I helped coach my guys through uh, promotion boards, mm -hmm. soldier of the month boards, NCO of the month boards, quarter of the month, all those. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seemed like it was just this constant, that was my job, right? And my job was to train and to develop and to mentor and to coach and to teach and to prepare. And it was all focused towards, you know, combat. But now I'm wondering if, if now today's leaders in the military, NCOs and officers, is part of our jobs now also to help prepare our soldiers or our, our uh, military um, enlisted or, low, or junior officers to uh, be successful once they get out of the military? Um, because, you know, I think I would have done things a little bit differently having, you know, now that I know what I know, uh, if I were to go back in time and I were to be a staff sergeant squad leader again, I think I would spend a little bit of time working with my guys on, you know, their interviewing skills, their networking skills, their, um, you know, their resume building skills, converting military language into civilian, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would have to, I'd have to obviously learn all that myself. Also, 
But how much of today's leaders uh, should we be obligated to help our our folks with that transition out of the military? Or is it really up to them to figure that out on their own? And, and as leaders in the military, we need to stay focused on the mission at hand. And that is, you know, you know, combat related or, or production protection or whatever our military mission is. What's your thoughts on that? Well, that's what we say is it's all up to the member. And we see in a lot of MOSs and a lot of specialties how a lot of things have been dumped on the member. And I don't, I, I think it, it's myopic. I think, I believe that soldier who is worried about finances, who is on deployment, is the same leadership issue as he might be when he gets out. And he's worried about finances, about how to find that next job. And the service comes from who we are and not what we wear. And if we want to make people leaders, if we're leaders developing leaders, we have to take the stride and the care to help people bridge that transition. The challenge becomes is when you have leaders who've never done it themselves. So it's, mm. we used to think it's a credibility gap, but I don't think it's that way anymore. I believe that you can, and again, within the constraints of whatever social media or external affairs agency you have, but you can develop the networks now to make it on the outside. And you know, one of my friends is getting out now after 13 years. Uh, 04, stellar career, did a year in Afghanistan, great guy. And he found a bridging organization in Silicon Valley, and he's making the jump without a net to the valley. And it's one example, but it's one of many. I, I think leaders have to consider their, their, their members across the board, whether they stay in or whether they get out. Now, the challenge becomes, we've been taught, well, not taught, but some parts of the culture say that that member who is focusing on getting out is road. They are retired in active duty. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it takes time to get your medical paperwork in order for your VA submission. It takes time to get your degree plan in order for you using your post 9-11 GI Bill. This stuff takes time. It takes us two, three, five years to read someone into the organization. And we expect them to ream themselves out of the organization in a year with a minimal safety net, a whole different support network, a whole different community, and it's not sustainable. It's not fair to the members who've given, in many cases, their, their best and, and brightest years in combat, or not in combat, or in support of combat, or in the field. You know, for us, it's about hazardous materials. You know, members get exposed to toxic chemicals on occasion, and they have to be able to give them the time to, to, to take care of themselves. I think, we know the numbers, you know, employment's higher in some cases for veterans than it is for non-veterans. We know that the Military Commission on Modernization of Retirement has said that transition GP GPS needs to be overhauled, and they've only invested $13 million in a transition GPS. So it's got to be at the deck plate, boilerplate, squat level of finding the time and finding the opportunity to talk about it. I have a sense for the way it is in the Army, mm -hmm. but let me ask about the Coast Guard. Do you see a lot of guys and gals, for that matter, um, getting out of the Coast Guard only to uh, re-enter after a period of time because they just just couldn't, I don't know, figure out a way to uh, make that, uh, that transition gap a successful one? Or they just, uh, for whatever reason, just kind of come back into the Coast Guard? Do you see that often? I don't see that often now. I see that... Uh, more often, I, I, members who in the mid '90s, during the higher tenure day, the first round of higher tenure, or early out, I see a lot of those members who got out and got back in. But now I don't. Now I see, you know, the Coast Guard retention stats are about as high as they've ever been. So I don't see a lot of people um, walking away to get back in. There are a few cases. You know, I have an E5 who made E6, got out, and now is an E01 in the IT field up in St. Louis. There are some cases, but it's not a lot. Okay, interesting. So let's get into your new book, Command Your Transition, Declare Your Intent, Craft Your Mission, Make It on the Outside. Now, where did the uh, idea for this book come from? I returned from deployment, went to LA, picked up my car, and I participated in an experience um, called The Art of Charm. So they're another podcast. They're a top 20 iTunes podcast. And it used to be one of those dating pickup podcasts, but it's turned more than that. It's more about personal transformation and uh, personal development. I went there because I knew being in Saudi, 
that I had a different view of the world that I wasn't expecting, whether it was how you drive, uh, the lack of access to alcohol, the lack of access to social opportunities. I knew that being back in America, I needed a way to orient or reorient myself to being back in America. And while I was there, there was an Army O3 who had just gotten back from Germany. He was there as well. And we had these long conversations about service and about development and about commitment. And you know, he was saying, I'm going to walk away before the O4 board. I'm, I'm done. I'm happy. I've had my time. I like Germany. And, but I'm going to a fort where I really didn't want to go. I'm not going to be happy going there. And I feel happier going to do Peace Corps work on the outside. And, and so from there, I started my travel across country to New Orleans over the next few weeks. And this whole idea about, well, you know, I'm moving to New Orleans and for right now, the Coast Guard has a early retirement program that is activated. I'm thinking, well, he knows what he wants to do. What, what do I want to do? Huh. And so I started doing the reading, the research, um, found my old TAPS book. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not a passive effort. This is an active effort. And from my friend in L.A., another friend of mine in Vegas who recently retired from the Air Force, and... Being here in New Orleans, I started to realize that, you know, now I've got to, now it hit me that I don't know where I'm going to live when I get out of the military. I have no idea. I don't want to live on the East Coast because I don't like the time zone because you can't watch football games late in the afternoon and still go out. <laughs> so I'm not going back to the East Coast. You know, I'm from Georgia. My parents are older. So that's, that's a consideration. I, I can't go to San Francisco because rent's expensive. I'm not paying two grand for a studio apartment with no, with no parking. So where do I want to live? And from there, I started thinking, what do I want to do? Do I want to use my degree? I definitely want to use my degree. And I started making the outline, not based on me, but based on a, an ideal reader named Samuel, who was a little earlier than me. Samuel is me had I made the decision to get out back in 2008, 2009. Um, Samuel is my fictional ideal reader who's a Navy E5 who tries to go OCS, but has a rough time on a second unit and then decides to walk away, uses GI Bill to go get a degree in electronics. And I'm thinking, you know, there, there are a lot of people like that. Not necessarily me in this impasse between 20, 10 and 20 years, but if you look at the four year gates when most members get out, year five, year 10, year 20, year 25, year 10 causes more friction than anything else. And I say it to myself in the, I say it to myself in the book, you know, I had these bits and pieces from coming back from deployment, but really I had made a year nine decision at year 11. And I can't go back on not making 04 now. So I realized I've been having an eye to the outside for a very long time. And I accepted that. And I realized that a lot of people should not let the military be their default decision just because they don't think of anything else. That is a bad way to serve and a bad way to lead. So the question came to me is, well, how do I help people not come to that same conclusion. And that's kind of how Command Your Transition came out. Um, I mean, the title came to me instantly back in November at Thanksgiving. You know, I, what, what do people have to be thankful for? Thankful for the life they have and the life they can live and the life they can lead in between. Yeah, there have been a lot of, a lot of flare sightings that have gotten me to see that year 10 is that point where you shit or get off the pot. Year 10, you're doing 20 in the current defined pension system. Um, now, with the Blender Retirement Program, and that news has come out about Blender Retirement, I believe more people will take and walk away than stay in because the, the incentive to stay from 10 to 20 isn't as great. And again, Congress has anticipated that by including continuation or incentive pay at the critical 12-year window. So I think more veterans are going to be more open to walking away at 10 years. I think more veterans are considering it. And I think if people want to continue to serve and they think the uniform is the best way for them to serve, that shouldn't be a default decision. That should be a transparent decision. That's kind of where this book came from. Mm, that's pretty cool. How long did it take? I know you said you had a, the, a previous book, um, Scale. How much longer after Scale did you write this book? Uh, Scale came out April of 14. I wanted to publish Commander Transition last fall, but honestly, I wasn't ready. I wasn't in the right state of mind for it. Um, I got back from deployment. I mean, my head was a thousand different directions. I was 
doing my fair share of partying, driving across country, finding a place to live, starting a new unit, getting back in the system, seeing my pain. I mean, it just, it, it wasn't. So really it's been a, exactly a year from when Scale published in April of 14 to when Commander Transition published this last week. Now, now, do you think through the process of writing this book, it brought any kind of additional clarity to your thought process in terms of your transition out? Absolutely. Number one thing it brought out for me were uh, Chad Storley, who, I, who's been very active in the veterans uh, transition community. He talks about this idea of geo. Um, when you get out, having a, a clear idea of the geography I, industry, an occupation of where you want to go. So taking a fix, you know, triangulate what you want to do. And that's been the number one thing for me is that I know now if I get the opportunity to retire next year, uh, the number one place I want to go is to stay in New Orleans for a while, use my GI Bill to get my MBA, as well as to continue my coaching practice. Number two is to move to Austin, go to UT Austin, use my GI Bill and keep my no state tax active. And then number three is to try out going into instructional design or organization design out in Palo Alto. So that made things incredibly, incredibly simple for me. And there's a couple other pieces as well that have, that have come out to help me out in considering my transition. I think the other thing that's probably been big for me is uh, the, the idea of Captain, General, and King. And this is an idea from Sebastian Marshall, who is a very prolific author. And... His quote that I use in the book is, to be a captain or a general or a king. And we like to say, you know, America is the land of opportunity, but at the same time, not everyone can be a king, not everyone can be Kobe Bryant that carries a basketball. Some people can be good captains, some people make great generals, and some people make great kings. And I know, at least in the military, my highest shot is captain. And I don't believe my career has put me in that trajectory. Tra trajectory, and I'm happy with that. However, in the train development community, in the instructional design community, in the coaching community, you know, to be a captain of that community still carries a phenomenal amount of opportunity and, and weight and passion for me and, and, and potential. And yeah, that's a stamp I think people need to take. Bill Clinton knew when he was 13, 14 years old, he wanted to be president of the United States, and he did it at 44. So that's, that's king-level mindset. That's high-born, king-level, I know what I'm going to do and want to get there, whatever it takes mindset. Whereas I'm 36, I'm a lot older, a little more banged up now. I don't need to be a king. I don't need to be a star. I just want to be a professional. So how can I be the best professional possible? And that, nice. yeah, that helped me out a lot. That's awesome. So, in terms of your book, I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, kind of paint a picture for our listener here. Sure. It, is your book so, is it more of a um, an educational read, kind of an eye opener? Huh? Maybe I should really consider that. Is it a more of an action based? Here's a list of things. Here's some checklists, some to dos, some don't dos. I mean, just kind of uh, summarize a little bit of what the reader could come to expect when they pick up your book. I want my reader, to pick up the book and take action. My book is organized in the three parts. So the subtitle, a Declare Your Intent, Craft Your Mission, Make It on the Outside, comes from this perspective of being one year from being out of the service, six months or so from being out of the service, and then Make It on the Outside is that first year after they've been out of the service. And I don't think a lot of books do that. I don't think a lot of books in our community, in this transition community, bridge the gap. Because the, the, the gap what the, is what causes the most pain. You know, the, it's a precipice. It's, it's dissonance between everything you had behind you in garrison and everything that won't be there with you when you go home when you hang up the uniform for the last time. So if my reader picks up chapter, oh, let's say chapter four, for example. So chapter four is this idea about strategy. And I use the joint pub definition of strategy. And I think... I believe that strategy is a way to orient how you look at your transition to make yourself most, most successful. And there's one common strategy that we know, and it's LIFO, last in, first out. So the last thing you do is the first thing you want to do on the outside, whether it's to be a Friday, Monday civilian, whether it's to be a contractor, whether it's to be 
a sort of somewhere in between, but the last thing you do, the last job you have, you, you try to find a way to turn it around to walk back in Monday morning with the requisite beard and cargo pants, and now that's your job the Monday morning after. Um, that's a very common strategy. I'm not hating that strategy, but for a lot of people, that's the only strategy they have. There are other strategies that are out there. Um, the Canvas strategy. So can you make a platform that helps other people? I mean, think about GORUCK, for example. GORUCK isn't just about incredibly useful and awesome backpacks. It's about a community of rocking for fitness. It's a community about endurance challenges for fitness and camaraderie. I mean, that's, that's the canvas, not, oh, I got a backpack, but no, I did a tough, or I did a heavy, or I did a light, or I did a kill that 5K, or whatever it is. Um, the study strategy is this idea of, and we do this too, we just don't really talk about it in terms of, I, I hate to say high strategy, but we don't talk about it strategically in that we go back to school, we find the degrees that work for us, we move on. Well, what if, for example, you thought of your next job as starting you on a 10-year journey, just like in the military, to master a specialty? Well, now how does that change your perspective? Now what degree would you go for? Would you use your GI Bill now or not? Would you start using TA now or not? Would you go to a different specialty or not? So I would want, in, like this one example, I want the reader to take chapter four, say, okay, I need a strategy. These are three examples. What other strategies could I use? And then orient their intent for a transition based on a strategy. Once we hang the uniform up, we don't have it anymore. Whether it's the 15% discount at Whole Foods, whether it's the thank you for your service we often hear wherever we go, whether it's the instant community you get wherever you transfer into, whether it is a duty station you did or not did not want to go to, whether it's the op tempo or battle rhythm, like we don't have that to come back into if we don't make it on the outside. So how do you inspire yourself and how do you look at your lifetime of yesterdays in a way that could continue to inspire you? Mm, that's awesome. I totally, I totally agree. And I, I talk with many veterans that, and they, and they say, it's funny, they kind of mimic the same verbiage and they say, you know, you'll, you'll never be as cool as you were when you were in. So you have to be, or find a way to be okay with that and move forward. And, um, and, and sometimes people, they, they find themselves stuck there mm -hmm. um, because when they're in the, the they're in the service, regardless of branch or mission, uh, one thing's in common for all of them, and that's you know everyone is serving a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. You know you can get up every day, put on your uniform, go to work, and you know that you know you you work for a higher purpose. There's something bigger than you. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you are not the only person on the, on, on the board of chess <laughs> that you are, you know what yeah, I mean? That you are, absolutely. you're, you're part of a team. And at the end of the day, you know, you can trace your chain of command all the way to the president of the United States. I mean, not everybody can say that. Mm -hmm. And, and it means something and you're wearing the flag of this great nation on your shoulder mm -hmm. and you know, it, and it, and it means something. Mm -hmm. And then you get out and it's like, mm -hmm. okay. I, all right, I've got this job. It's paying the bills, but what does it really mean to me? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, what what am I doing here? And that a lot of people, and I and I say a lot of people, but I'm really saying myself. That's that's where I found myself. I found myself going from you know a senior squad leader, you know, mm -hmm. commanding and controlling nine guys on the streets of Baghdad, mm -hmm. to an individual contributor at a corporation. Going, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, I felt underutilized. I felt underappreciated. I felt, um, you know, there was no higher purpose, no higher meaning. I'm like, this, this is just, you know, I mean, granted, I got paid in the military. We all do. Not a whole hell of a lot. But I never went to work every day and said, oh, man, this is just a paycheck for me. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. And uh, I get out and sometimes I go to work and it's like, man, you know, just punching a ticket. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and this is my life. And uh, my recommendation to those folks that find themselves in that in that boat is to find something you're passionate about, even if it's outside of your career or your, your current job, mm -hmm. and get involved and get hooked up. What would be – give me three 
I'm putting you on a spot here, sure. but give me three things that people that are currently serving can do wherever they are, whether it's, you know, a month out, two months out, six, six months, a year, two years. What's three things that everyone can do today to help prepare them for when they do get out? Number one thing is network. And I know we hear that all the time. I, I say this in the book. You should be so networked that you are having dinner with your hiring manager the Sunday before your interview on Monday morning at the company you want to work at. That's the level. And it's, you know, it's counterinsurgency. It is. It's, it's network centric. It's figure out who the influencers are, get to them, serve them, and in turn they will serve you. And you know, we say network about you know, use LinkedIn. We say network about uh, follow these groups. But no, I mean truly network and put faces to names. Look at the pictures in the living room. Network. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think number two is expect a dip. I, I don't think a lot of us expect that. I think, I, I believe that we don't see the dip that's coming until the dip already has us. And that dip could be the first year of employment out. That dip could be the first place we move to after we leave. I, I think, I believe, that first year out, pack light, travel light, dismount if you have to. That first year is not supposed to be set in stone. And the third thing would be to be honest about your reason. You know, don't get out of the military, realize that the same bad bosses you thought you got away with from are still there. Maybe it's not the bosses, maybe it's you. And that's not an indictment, it's just, you know, be honest about why you're in, be honest about why you're getting out. If your, if your service is something beyond the military, then take it. If your service is something within the military, then take the military as far as you can go. But be honest about it. Be transparent with yourself about it. I always hated, speaking of OERs, the officers who would get their evals back and who would say, okay, I got a five in judgment. We'll say, you got a five in judgment. All right, so I need to find the projects to give me a six in judgment. No, you don't. You need to do your job. You need to do your job well. You need to serve other people. You need to serve your team and your subordinates. And, and then the numbers will take care of themselves. Don't play the game to the numbers. It's just, it's, it's not, that's not how you lead. You don't lead by the paper. You lead by example. You lead by what's needed. You lead by what needs to be done. So network, expect a dip, be honest. That's awesome. I like those. And, and I got to ask, um, I'm, again, I'm putting my sure. ignorant... I'm putting my ignorant hat on here. Expect the dip. I'm assuming, is that something that uh, Coast Guard or Navy say, like, uh, does it have anything to do with the uh, when you're on a boat and uh, you're hitting some waves? <laughs> no, no, no. Normally you're rocking and rolling when you get waves, depending on where okay. you are. Uh, I, as I'm, I'm picturing myself on a boat and a term coming out saying, you know, expect the dip, and that's <laughs> uh, otherwise you're finding yourself overboard. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, we don't say expect the dip. Um, yeah, we don't. I'm trying to think. Maybe if you're in the bear and you're facing 30 footers, you expect it. To... No, we don't. No, it's, not a, <laughs> it's not a sailorism. Okay. All right. I didn't know. Just curious. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, um, all right. So we're wrapping up. Well, I can't believe time is already. Wow. We're already over an hour. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Time flies when you're having fun, man. We could talk. I could talk like for this this stuff for hours and for days. Uh -huh. um, it just fascinates me. But um, and because, you know, I, it, what's so fascinating about it more than anything is I hear so many different, um, perspectives and ways, uh, that people think about, you know, essentially tackling the same objective and it's, you know, they're all different, but yet they're all very similar at the same time. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, so this is really cool. I've got another, uh, couple questions, but before I ask those, I do want to, um, let all the listeners out there know, um, that if you go on to, um, the first person to go on to iTunes and leave a review about this interview with Travis, uh, will receive a free copy of his book. I will get in contact with you and, uh, hook up with you on the email, get your address or do whatever we got to do. Uh, now is your book available in hard copy yet, or is it just a, uh, a digital type of like an ebook? Just an ebook on Kindle right now. Okay. 
All right, excellent. So again, if you are the first person to leave me a review on Change Your POV Podcast on iTunes, uh, we will hook you up. I should say Travis will hook you up with a free copy of his book. That's a very uh, that's a very gracious offer. And anyone that is currently serving is looking to get out is probably it should be grabbing this book. Um, and I think there's probably some good value add based off of your description of your book for those that may have already gotten out and, and just looking for um, some tips and some ideas post-military as well. So this isn't just for people that are in. Uh, it's for them, uh, obviously, but it but can also be for those that have already uh, taken that uniform off and are looking to navigate through this 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 world outside of the military. All right, cool. We're going to get into, as you know, this show is called Change Your POV or Point of View. I like to ask all my guests a closing question. Give us an example or a scenario of a time when you believed or thought something one way, but an event or circumstance occurred that forced you to see it from a different perspective. What was it and what did you learn from the experience? I'll use my Saudi deployment as a great example. So I deployed for a year to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to help the uh, Ministry of the Interior establish a critical infrastructure protection force. So they were supposed to build up a, a 5,000 member security force to protect MCIKR all up and down the kingdom. Uh, the team before us decided that they were gonna use the Coast Guard's training system footprint to help the Saudis build out the training system for this force. And that was already in some stage of construction or development when we got on the ground. About a third of the way through my time in Saudi, we got a chance to go see their maritime boot camp out in Jeddah and Jitta on the, the western region. We realized that we had made the mistake of not using as much of the Saudi infrastructure that was existing versus pushing the Saudis to make something new. And both ways could work, but it's a question of time. It's a question of how much time do we have to get these soldiers ready for protecting the kingdom in the maritime domain. So our POV change, my point of view change specifically on the training officer side, was about trying to make as much of the training pipeline Saudi-derived um, as possible, using as much of the existing Saudi training system as possible because that was what was going to do the assignment selection. That was what the Saudis were familiar with. And in the end, that was what would lead to adoption of our training curriculum and methods and outcomes to help train and develop this 5,000 member force. That's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally, uh, I totally can see sometimes it, sometimes we want to push down our own, ways of doing things down, down, uh, down the throats of, 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 uh, you know, the, the foreign forces. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we wonder why it doesn't work, right? We did the same thing in Iraq when we were training the Iraqi civil defense Corps, which then became the uh -huh. Iraqi national guard, which then became the, the Iraqi regular army mm -hmm. and, and, you know, trying to teach, like, for example, here's a small example of what you just said, you know, trying to teach them, you know, nine to the front, six to the rear, you know, and, mm -hmm. and march the way that we march. Um, you know what? They don't. They don't march the way we march. They they have a different mannerism about themselves. They 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 carry themselves different. And instead of trying to um, have them conform to our way, we we just allowed them to conform to their way of doing things, and they were able to uh, move much faster um, because. You know, they were still learning the the ins and outs of of the you know the demission, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't we didn't force the idiosyncrasies of each of those you know little mannerisms that 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 uh, define the two different cultures. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, hey, you know what? Um, welcome to Change Your POV community. Uh, you are now a part of it for the rest of your life. Um, I look forward to you, following up. Yeah, I look forward to following up with you and, and kind of I want I would love to have you come back on the show after you've gotten out and let us know kind of how that transition happened for you and 
maybe some things that, that popped up you didn't expect and how you handled them. That'd be very cool to get kind of a before and after take on on that. So um, I know you got a little ways to go, but still, I'll be around and just uh, you've got my contact information. Just reach out and uh, love to keep tabs on what's what's going on with you. Awesome, Eddie. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And no problem. So for everyone out there, you definitely got to pick up Command Your Transition uh, by Travis. Where can folks find your book and find you and, and, and be able to connect with you? So the book is on Kindle on Amazon. It is free until either Tuesday or Wednesday. And then after that, it'll be two ninety nine. dollars The money doesn't come from the book. The money for me isn't about, it's more about the message and about reach than it is cashed in on a book. Um, you can find me online on Facebook. So I run a group called Command Your Transition, just after the book title. On Facebook, you can find me there. I don't, I used to have a blog. Um, I shut my blog down and I really do three to five posts a week strictly in the Command Your Transition group. So come on in and talk with other veterans about the experiences you're having. That's awesome. So this episode actually airs, will we'll go live on May 3rd which will be after the the free period time, unfortunately. No problem. Um, but that's okay. That's still a very reasonable uh, price for sure for for something of this uh, of this quality. So um, definitely go and check that out. I will have the the links in the show notes um, to everything we discussed, including the links to the uh, the Amazon book um, on the show notes page of this episode. Um, thanks for coming on, Travis. I really appreciate your time and, uh, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your service and tell all of the, uh, the Coasties that I, uh, Sergeant from the army says hello and God bless. I, I will definitely do that. Thank you so much, Eddie. All right. You can find all of the show notes, like I said, for this episode over at changerpub.com forward slash episode 48. Never miss an episode. Hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. We have a lot more great content headed your way. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me at eddie at changeyourpov.com. I would love to hear from you. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Change Your POV Podcast with Eddie Lazary. Check out more content by going to changeyourpov.com. And remember, your ability and willingness to change your point of view will open doors of opportunity.